USS Helena is quite possibly the most famous light cruiser to ever serve in the United States Navy. During two brutal, close-quarter night engagements in the waters off Guadalcanal, she blasted away at elements of the Imperial Japanese Navy with such ferociousness and pace that the American press dubbed her the Machine Gun Cruiser, as did the Japanese that lived to tell of her exploits. She helped to make the surface fleet relevant again in the new age of the aircraft carrier, and while doing so, helped give the U.S. Navy the victories it needed in a campaign that was still very much in doubt. Helena was the second and final member of the St. Louis class to be built. Her keel was laid down at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on December 9, 1936, and she was launched less than two years later in August of 1938. She had an overall length of 608 feet, a beam of 61 feet, and a standard displacement of 10,000 tons. Her main battery consisted of 15 6-inch 47 caliber guns housed in five triple turrets, three forward and two aft. Her main battery had an incredible rate of fire, as much as 8 to 10 rounds per minute per barrel under perfect conditions. These numbers were based on pre-war tests conducted by the Brooklyn-class cruisers Savannah and Honolulu which carried the same main battery as Helena. Although she never officially obtained this rate of fire herself, she was nicknamed the Machine Gun Cruiser by the press after her exploits in the Solomons during late 1942. Her secondary battery consisted of eight of the versatile 5-inch 38 caliber guns, which were mounted in four twin-barreled turrets, one mount on each side of her forward superstructure and one mount on both sides of her aft superstructure. At the time of her commissioning, Helena's light anti-aircraft battery consisted of 850 caliber machine guns. Helena's main armor belt was 5 inches thick. She had 2 inches of deck armor and 6 inches protecting her turrets and barbettes. She was powered by four geared turbines, which each drove one shaft using the steam provided by eight oil-fired boilers. Rated for 100,000 shaft horsepower, she was capable of 32.5 knots and had a range of 10,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. She was manned by 868 officers and enlisted men. Helena commissioned into the fleet on September 18, 1939, and her shakedown crews took her all the way down to Uruguay, where her crew got to inspect the wreck of the recently scuttled German cruiser Admiral Graf Spee. The rest of her pre-war service was fairly uneventful. She was transferred to the Pacific Fleet in September 1940, and for the next year trained and exercised in Hawaiian waters. In July 1941, she entered the Mare Island Navy Yard for an overhaul and received four quadruple-mounted 1.1-inch anti-aircraft guns to beef up her AA battery. After this work was completed in mid-September, she returned to Hawaiian waters. On the morning of December 7, 1941, she was moored at the 1010 dock in the Pearl Harbor Navy Yard, in the spot normally reserved for the battleship Pennsylvania. As Japanese pilots were expecting a battleship to be there, she became an unintentional prime target early on. During the opening minutes of the attack, several torpedo planes made runs on her before realizing she wasn't Pennsylvania. The lead plane was the only one to drop its deadly cargo, though and it struck Helena amidships on her starboard side after passing under the mine layer that was tied up alongside her. Her engine room and a boiler room were destroyed and flooded. Wiring to her main and secondary batteries was severed, but prompt action by her crew brought the forward diesel generator up within two minutes, which restored power to all of her gun mounts. She was straddled by four near misses during the second wave, which showered her decks with shrapnel, causing no damage but plenty of casualties. Outstanding damage control work and the fact that watertight integrity was maintained throughout the ship is what kept Helena afloat that Sunday morning. In all, she lost 40 men killed, and another 100 were wounded. The Japanese would surely come to regret not sinking the cruiser, which would become a thorn in their side during the Guadalcanal campaign. By December 9th, Helena was in dry dock number 2 at Pearl Harbor to have steel plates welded over the hole in her hull and by the end of 1941, she was afloat again. On January 5, 1942, she got underway for Mare Island for permanent repairs and an overhaul which lasted until early July. 
In addition to the repairs from the torpedo strike, Helena had her conning tower replaced with an open bridge in order to increase visibility. Her 1.1-inch AA guns were replaced by 16 40mm Bofors guns arranged in four quadruple mounts, and her machine guns were replaced by eight 20mm Ehrlichon autocannons. She also received an SG surface search radar, an SC air search radar, and FC and FD fire control radar sets for her main and secondary batteries. Helena departed San Francisco in late July, bound for the South Pacific, with her crew seeking revenge for the events of the previous December. She arrived in the New Hebrides on August 11th and was attached to Task Force 61 on September 1st to support the aircraft carrier Hornet. On the 11th, she began screening for WASP and was in her screen when the flat top took three Japanese torpedoes on the 15th. One torpedo passed astern of Helena before striking the destroyer USS O'Brien operating over five miles away in Hornet's task force. After Wasp was ordered abandoned, Helena rescued survivors and delivered them to Espiritu Santo the next day. Helena returned to Hornet's task group after the loss of Wasp, and on the 23rd, she was added to the active roster of Task Force 64, which was comprised of cruisers and destroyers and specifically set up to deal with the nightly runs of the Tokyo Express down the slot. It was in this unit that Helena and her crew would make a name for themselves over the coming months. On September 24th, the last domino fell in place when Captain Gilbert C. Hoover assumed command of Helena. Task Force 64 began preparing in earnest for their date with history, and on October 9th, were ordered to the south of Rennell Island where they participated in what amounted to cruiser intramurals as they waited for the next move of the Tokyo Express. Finally, on the afternoon of October 11th, U.S. reconnaissance planes detected Japanese vessels heading down the slot toward Guadalcanal. Admiral Norman Scott, the commander of Task Force 64, was intent on making sure those ships would not make it there and ordered his units to intercept. By 10.30 that night, Scott had arranged his unit into a line with three destroyers out front, followed by the cruiser's San Francisco, which was Scott's flagship, Boise, Salt Lake City, and Helena, then two destroyers in the rear of the column. Scott showed his ignorance of the emerging advantage the U.S. had in radar with his battle formation and choice of flagship. Helena and Boise both carried new SG radar sets, which were significantly more effective than the older SC sets carried by the other vessels in the column, and thus, it would have been wise on Scott's part to use one of them as his flagship in order to have a clearer picture of the battlefield, especially in a night action. The SG radars on Helena and Boise detected the Japanese force just before 11.30. Shortly after, the U.S. battle line reversed course and began steaming to the southwest. This course reversal made by sheer coincidence as Scott was basically running blind in San Francisco, placed Helena and her pals in a position to cross the T of the Japanese formation. At a quarter to midnight, the SC set on Scott's flagship San Francisco finally detected the Japanese at a range of 5,000 yards. Captain Hoover, by this time, had been requesting permission to open fire for some time, and after finally receiving what he interpreted as an affirmative answer, ordered his guns to commence firing. The rest of the U.S. battle line quickly followed suit, and soon the night devolved into chaos or a blazing bedlam, as one junior officer aboard Helena wrote afterwards. The Japanese were caught completely off guard, with their commander even believing he was in the middle of a friendly fire incident. Helena's guns, firing in rapid succession, spit out round after round as spent powder casings tumbled across her deck. Her opening shellfire struck the cruiser Aoba, inflicting serious damage while also mortally wounding the commander of the force, causing further confusion among the Japanese formation. The cruiser Furutaka attempted to come to Aoba's aid and was rewarded by numerous hits from the American column, one of which detonated the torpedoes in her deck launchers, causing a massive explosion and fire. Aoba survived the battle but was heavily damaged after being raked by American fire. Furutaka eventually sank, as did the destroyer Fubuki, with Helena contributing greatly to both vessels' demise. As quickly as it began, it was over. Fifteen minutes of fire and fury, 
and the U.S. Navy had the victory it needed to stop the bleeding in the Solomons for the time being. Helena emerged from the Battle of Cape Esperance with several superficial hits, one of which went through her searchlight platform. Her fire control radar had helped keep her safe. No visual point of aim was needed to lay her guns on a target. The other ships, minus Boise, had to use star shells or searchlights to illuminate their targets, and, on that night, whenever a ship became illuminated, she caught hell. Over the next month, Helena patrolled the waters around Guadalcanal with Task Force 64 and provided occasional fire support to the troops ashore. On November 11th, Helena and her task force were assigned to protect a large reinforcement convoy as it headed to and offloaded at Guadalcanal. On the 12th, Helena helped repel a large air attack and suppressed Japanese artillery taking shots at the transport ships. Then, word came that the Tokyo Express was once again steaming down the slot. Now led by Rear Admiral Daniel J. Callahan, Helena's task force was once again assigned to derailed the express. The Japanese entered Iron Bottom Sound just before 1.30 on the morning of the 13th, and, at about a quarter to two, the waters of the sound once again unravel into total chaos. Helena began the point-blank melee by firing on what her crew believed was a Japanese battleship at a mere 4,200 yards, with the rapid fire of her main batteries, before turning her attention to the destroyer Akatsuki. Bombarded by several other vessels as well, Akatsuki exploded and quickly sank. Helena then shifted her fire to another destroyer, only to be forced to check her fire when San Francisco passed between the two vessels. Helena, undaunted by San Francisco's maneuver, scored several hits which forced her aggressor to disengage, she turned her attention to three other Japanese destroyers and raked them with main battery fire. She scored several hits, forcing one to withdraw while another was set on fire. Her 40mm guns lit up the cruiser Nagara around this time, and, as the battered San Francisco continued on through the melee, she attempted to follow her to try to protect her from further abuse. For as much violence as Helena had been exposed to during the 40-minute battle, she once again emerged with only superficial damage, and one man killed. As the Japanese withdrew back up the slot, all able vessels were ordered by Hoover, who was now in tactical command, to retire to the southeast just before 2.30. The valor and great sacrifice of the men of Task Force 64 had turned the Japanese back. Captain Hoover was relieved of command on November 23rd for failing to adequately report the loss of USS Juno, which occurred as the task force retired. Helena's next action would come in early January 1943, when she moved up the Solomon chain to bombard Japanese installations at Munda on the island of New Georgia. Later in the month, she bombarded the Japanese garrison at Vila. Helena played a supporting role in the Battle of Rennell Island at the end of January, before being dispatched to Sydney, Australia in mid-February for repairs and an overhaul. Upon her return to the combat zone, Helena and her crew patrolled the slot and peppered the coast of New Georgia numerous times in preparation for the upcoming campaign to take it. The initial invasion began on June 30th and saw Helena patrolling the northern Coral Sea as part of a cruiser-destroyer task force. Helena's task force then covered the second landing at Rice Anchorage in the early morning hours of July 5th. She fired over 1,006 and 5-inch rounds during a 20-minute shore bombardment that preceded the landings. After retiring to Tulagi to refuel, the task force was abruptly ordered back up the slot to intercept a run of the Tokyo Express heading to New Georgia. Helena's task force entered Kula Gulf just after midnight on July 6th. The Japanese were already in the Gulf unloading their cargoes by this time and detected the American ships on radar at just after 1 a.m. About 30 minutes later, the U.S. force detected the Japanese. The two sides then began to close on each other. At 1.57, Helena opened up on the lead Japanese destroyer. She quickly expended her flashless propellant charges that had been kept after the previous night's bombardment mission and thereafter transitioned to normal smokeless propellant, which created large flashes every time her guns were fired. The lead destroyer was quickly sunk, and Helena turned her attention to the next closest ship. But by this time, 
Eight long lance torpedoes were already heading toward the American line. Just after two, three of these torpedoes slammed into her port side. The first torpedo strike near turret one caused a massive explosion which may have been the result of her magazine exploding. It destroyed turret one and severed her bow from the rest of her hull. The force of the blast blew in the bulkheads below turret two and she began to take on water, but even after the severe damage inflicted by the first torpedo, her aft batteries continued to pound away and she was still making 25 knots. The second and third torpedoes struck her in quick succession not long after the first. These two strikes were close together and below her armor belt. Her forward machinery spaces were wiped out and her keel was broken. Flooding from the massive hole in her hull disabled her remaining engines and boilers, leaving her dead in the water. It quickly became clear that she would not survive the engagement, and the order to abandon ship was quickly passed. With her keel broken, what remained of her hull broke in half, and the center third of the ship sank pretty quickly, while her bow and stern floated for several more hours before eventually sinking as well. Some of her survivors were actually fired on by both sides as they clung to her bow in the darkness. Rescue efforts were hampered repeatedly by the presence of Japanese ships, and at first light, the destroyers Nicholas and Radford heeded their orders and withdrew before Japanese planes could attack. Together, they had picked up 735 men of Helena's crew. Eventually, through several harrowing operations, 253 more survivors were rescued from the areas around Kula Gulf. In all, 168 men of Helena's crew lost their lives during the Battle of Kula Gulf. The fightinest ship in the Navy was discovered in April 2018 by the research ship RV Petrel during an expedition to the Solomons. Her identity was confirmed by the still visible hull number on her stern. She lies at a depth of about 2,800 feet. Helena was awarded seven battle stars for her service during World War II and was the first ship to receive the Navy Unit Commendation for her actions in the battles of Cape Esperance, Guadalcanal, and Kula Gulf. She, along with the gallant, unwavering men who manned her, helped turn the tide of the Guadalcanal campaign in the favor of the Allies. Thank you for watching. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Comment and subscribe so that we can bring you more content just like this.